Hey there, drone fans. Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I'd like to answer a few more questions that folks have been asking about the brand new Evo 2. Now, every week we get tons of questions from viewers asking about different features and functions of the Evo 2. And as a pilot <laughs> and a nerd, I love nothing more than diving in deep to find those answers and getting back to you. Now, most of the time, they're simple questions where I can reply to an email or I'll post a comment on YouTube to answer the question. But every now and then, the question's a little bit more complex and it involves a little bit more testing. So I'll head out in the field, I'll do the testing, and then I'll put a clip like this together to answer five or six of those questions at one time. Now, these questions today were the most popular questions we've been asked since we did the last clip. And some of these I held off on because a new version of the firmware was just shipped to me yesterday and I've loaded it on the drone. It's version V.1.0.8. And some of the features that people were asking about testing were in the application, but they weren't actually enabled yet, I think on the beta firmware. So I wanted to wait until this new version came out. So if I showed you the screens of how you get to those different adjustments inside the application, they would be pretty close to the one you'd see when you're flying your drone. So I'll go through these five questions and I put a time code below. So if you're not interested in one of the questions, you can skip ahead to one of the others in case it's the one you've asked. Now, I expect there'll be other questions because we've got a pile of them that I'll have to answer in another uh, clip coming up soon, so stay tuned for that. But for today, I'm going to tackle the top five that came in since the last clip was put up. And again, some of these I couldn't test until this firmware was released. So the first question has to do with the gimbal movement. Now, a lot of the quads on the market today, some of the Mavic products, certainly the Paranafi, allow you to take the gimbal above the horizon. So normally, a gimbal will go down 90 degrees and straight to the horizon. Horizon. With the Mavic series, you can go up 30 degrees. And with the Anafi series, you can go up 90 degrees. So you've got a full 180 degree gimbal movement on the Anafi. That's not possible here because obviously the camera's underneath some of the electronics. So the best we can hope for is an up 30 degree mark. And that's been in the firmware, but it hasn't been enabled. So I went out and tested that in the field and it actually works really well. And you might be thinking, why do I care about pivoting my gimbal above the horizon. But there are times where you want to sort of look up at something. Maybe it's a sunset or it's the moon rising or you want to see the top of a tree. And if you can't go above the horizon, that means you've got to physically lift the drone up to the point where the camera can see it at a horizontal view. So having that extra 30 degrees up really makes a big difference. So first I'll show you how to enable it. It's really simple. And then I'll show you an example outside where I was just flying in the front yard, looking at one of the trees that's in bloom. It's a beautiful time of year. And then pivot that gimbal up 30 degrees above that tree so you can actually see the sky above it. So stay tuned and I'll show you how to do the setting first and then I'll show you how it looks from the camera perspective. To enable the expanded travel of the camera, you'll start at the main menu of the application and tap the settings icon in the upper right hand corner of the screen. It looks like a little gear. Then you'll tap the gimbal tab on the left hand side and you can enable the gimbal pitch limit by sliding the button next to it to the right. Now I'll show you the advantage of being able to swing your camera upward I'm hovering in front of a tree in full bloom, and if I wanted to see the top of this tree with most drones, I'd have to elevate to that height and look straight at it. Since I have this feature enabled, I can slowly swing the camera upward to see the top of the tree well above the drone and even catch some of the sky behind it in the frame as well. This one feature really does expand your filming options with the Evo 2. This next question was easily the most popular one asked by viewers, and it was, does the Evo 2 support waypoints? Now that can be a deal breaker for a lot of flyers out there, especially if you're gonna use the drone commercially, because being able to set up a virtual pattern of behavior in the sky over a particular target, then when you hit the start button, the drone will execute autonomously is an incredibly powerful thing. So imagine the drone flies to the first waypoint, takes a picture of something, then it elevates and maybe even spins and starts recording video footage at the second waypoint, does something different at the third, fourth, and fifth. You've got a drone that is really like a flying robot that's running this mission for you that you can repeat over a period of time. You can actually save that pattern and run it every other day or once a month or every couple of weeks. And if you're surveying a field, that can be really powerful to monitor crop growth. Or if you're watching a construction project, trying to gauge how much work is getting done over the course of a couple of months, maybe for insurance purposes, you've got all that data and you can just go out in the field once you've saved that pattern, hit the button and have it run it every time you want it to run. So having waypoints inside the unit is really powerful. Now, a lot of other drones can kind of do waypoints. They're not that sophisticated, but there's a ton of third-party applications out there that can really do some pretty incredible patterns and monitoring of different areas. But having it in the drone is a really good thing. So the short answer is that yes, it can run waypoints. And they don't call it waypoints, they call them missions. And the good news is that the geniuses at Autel have actually built in three predefined formats that you can use. There's one 
some cold waypoints where you can actually point at the map and put dots out there and it'll fly to those different dots and you can modify those. It's got a rectangular one which sets up a rectangle and you can sort of expand it and spin it and all that. And then the last one is called a polygon where you can actually have this weird shape and make it go zigzag across the field or around the corner. It's a lot of different ways you can modify it. So what I'll show you next is how you get to those different missions. And I'll show you some examples really quickly of what they look like. Now I'm going to do a full clip running these missions out in the field. So I'll have that coming up soon. But this is one of those that wasn't really enabled before it was working, but it wasn't working great. In this latest version, it's working great. So I'm going to spend some time and put that clip together. But for now, let me show you how to get at those missions and what they look like, just so you have a rough idea of how sophisticated this drone really is. To access the missions menu, you'll start on the splash screen of the application, and instead of tapping the camera tab to fly your quad, you'll want to choose the missions tab. You're then presented with three choices for the type of mission that best fits the area that you'd like to fly and a list of other missions you've created and saved. Choosing waypoints takes you to the main screen for this type of mission. Once here, you can tap the screen to start setting up your waypoints, and you can set up as many waypoints as you want. Each one of these waypoints you create will be a location in the air that your quad will fly to and complete a specific action. This can include taking a picture or recording some video before flying along to the next waypoint. Once you are finished creating all of the waypoints you need, you can tap on each one of them individually and make adjustments to the action the drone will complete while at that waypoint. When you're finished, tap the icon on the right to start flying this particular mission. The next mission is called Rectangular, and you can choose this one by tapping that tab. To get started, simply tap the Create Project button on screen, and this will place a rectangular mission around your current position with a default size and orientation. You can easily modify this initial map to suit your needs by simply dragging the waypoints. When you're finished, tap the icon on the right to start flying this mission. The final mission is called Polygon and can be started by tapping the corresponding tab. To get started with this mission, tap Create Project and you'll see an outline of the pattern the drone will fly. You can adjust this shape as needed to accommodate the area you'd like to cover. When you're finished, tap the icon on the right to start flying this mission. This next question was, can I change the home point? And I think where that question's coming from is normally a drone will set the home point at the takeoff point. So if you've got a mat, when it takes off, it registers that as its home point. And if you're flying for a while and you get into trouble or the drone senses something going wrong, it'll automatically do a return to home and come back and land right where it took off. But let's pretend for a second that you've launched it from a boat and then you've driven that boat across the lake a little bit, if it goes into a return to home, it's gonna go back to where it took off and there's gonna be no boat there. So having the ability to choose the waypoint either be the point of takeoff or the person flying the drone because you've got the controller in your hands is a really powerful thing. So this drone allows you to choose between the takeoff point or the controller, which is called me in the application, where it'll either land where it took off or it'll follow the controller to wherever it happens to be when it's time to return to home. In addition to that, there's a couple other cool things that they built into here around visual navigation aids that really impact the return to home. And I'll talk about those in this section as well. But first I'll show you how to decide between landing where it took off or landing where the controller happens to be. And then I'll show you what those other features are that you can turn on or turn off depending on your, your needs out there in the field. To choose which home point you want the quad to return to, you'll start at the main screen of the application and tap the settings icon in the upper right hand corner. This looks like a little gear. Then you'll tap the general tab on the left. In the upper right hand corner, you have a choice of where the quad lands. If you select aircraft, the drone will return to its original position, and if you choose me, the drone will find the controller when returning to home. There are three more interesting settings that affect the return to home function, and to access those, tap the visual navigation tab on the left-hand menu. Scroll to the bottom of the page and tap advanced settings to see the three options. Downward vision positioning helps the drone to maintain its position when GPS signals are weak, and it actually improves the accuracy of the landing. Landing protection allows the drone to detect an unsafe landing area if there are obstacles below it and make accommodations for those obstacles. The accurate landing option will guide the drone to as close as possible to its return to home point for a near precision landing. I always recommend that all three of these options are turned on to help with an accurate return to home. I spent a little time testing this to see if the precision landing has been improved with the latest version of the firmware, and I'll show you the results next. 
Today I'm outside to test the precision landing of the return to home function on the Evo 2 behind me. Now the last time I did this test, I had a beta version of the firmware, which I don't think they enabled the precision landing in yet, and I got close to the mat on all the 25 times I tested it, but it didn't land exactly where it took off. I'm hoping, since I've downloaded a new version of the firmware that's the release version, that they've actually enabled precision landing on the quad. Now the reason I'm standing so far back from it is because it's got incredibly accurate crash avoidance, and I don't want it to see me as something it should avoid on the way down, so I'm trying to stay back really far away from it so that I don't impact its ability to land where it took off. Now, the test is going to be simple. I've set the return to home height at 120 feet. I'm going to send it downfield about 200 feet, hit the return to home key, let it do what it's going to do, and let's see how close it comes to the mat. So I'll spin up the props, and I'll elevate it a little bit, give it about five feet of elevation, just to give it a chance to fix its position. And I know a lot of people suggest that you need it 25 feet, so let me take it up. That's 15 feet right there. And another five feet will be 20. So I'm giving it three different stops to try and fix its position. Give it a couple of seconds. Start recording. All right, I'll send it downfield and I'll try and get it up above those trees because that would be a horrific crash during the test if I took it into a pine tree. All right, we're downfield about 100 feet, 130, 170. All right, we're at about 200 feet there. I'm comfortable with that. Now I'll hit the return to home key. It takes a couple seconds for it to recognize that. Okay, there's the beep. It's now in return to home mode. It's elevating. We're up to 80 feet, 100 feet. Should stop at 120. Right on the money, 120 feet. It stopped, it's sitting there trying to fix its position and figure out where it took off. Okay, it spun around, it's heading back my direction now. Coming back really quick. And it's just about over the mat, and it's slowed down. And it looks like it's making some adjustments up there, so I, I really believe that it's looking down at that map, in addition to the GPS coordination it's using. It's now spun around to face the same direction it was in when it took off, and it's descending. Now, I'm back, I don't know, 25, 30 feet away from it, and it looks like it's pretty close. It may be off to the right a little bit, but we'll see as it gets closer. Looks like it's making some adjustments on the way down, so that's encouraging. Yeah, I actually think it moved over to the left a little bit, so... It's coming down. From this angle, it looks like it's gonna land right on the mat. So now that I'm not near it, I can't, I can't really tell, but let's see what happens. Boy, is this gonna be close. Oh man, that's right on the money. I'm gonna call it a boom. I'm gonna call it a boom. That's a precision landing. And the reason I'm gonna give it a couple of inches is because it's kind of windy out here. And when it went up, it kind of drifted a tiny bit to the side when I held it at five feet. So I think if it fixed its position when it was off the mat at five feet, it's gonna land exactly where it took that picture. So I'm gonna test it a bunch more times, but at this point, I think if they haven't fixed it perfectly, they've actually improved it dramatically over the other tests I did. Because in those tests earlier, it was off the map by four or five feet, which again, at the time I said, I don't really care because I don't need it to land on a dime on the mat. As long as it gets back to where it took off, I'm more than happy to take control with the sticks and land it myself because maybe things have changed since it took off and I've got to land it somewhere else. So I like the fact that it got it back and I can adjust it if I need to, but for me, man, that's close. That's really, really close. So I'll do it a couple more times. If I get a better result, I'll show you what that looks like. But right now I'm going to have to say that they've definitely improved the return to home and the precision landing to me looks almost on the money. This next question was, how can I see the battery details and how much control do I have over those batteries? So this is a great question because a lot of the quads out there have automatic discharge. The batteries in this are intelligent enough that if you have them fully charged and you put them away for a period of time, you don't want to store them fully charged. So the battery is smart enough to say, you know what, Rick forgot that I was fully charged and that's not a healthy state for me to stay for any length of time. So I'm going to automatically start to discharge. And in some of the quads that do that, you don't have a lot of control over how soon that starts or how long that discharge takes. So in this drone, people were asking, can I modify that discharge rate? Can I start it the first day that I've got it in the case? Can I delay it for up to six days? And the answer is you can, and I'll show you how to get at that setting. The other question had to do with the return to home thresholds because the drone drone is smart enough to know that if you're flying and you're not paying attention to the battery levels, if it gets to a critical case where it's far enough away, where if you fly it any longer, you're not going to have enough battery power to get it back to your takeoff point, the drone will take over. Well, there are settings inside the drone where you can set that critical battery level, those thresholds that actually trigger the warning where it's beeping at you to say, hey, turn around and come home, and the return to home threshold where it says, I've given up on you, I'm flying home because you're going to crash if I don't do that. Those are in there as well, and I'll show you how to set both of those. First, I'll show you how to set what I'll call the decay rate, which is basically the discharge rate of how many days it takes to start the discharge, and second, I'll talk about 
about how to set those two thresholds. To access the battery settings page, start in the main menu and tap the settings icon in the upper right hand corner. Locate the aircraft battery tab on the left and tap that. On the next page, you'll find all the information you'll need about your battery's health. The first thing you may want to adjust are the battery thresholds that trigger a low battery warning and a critically low battery warning. The first threshold will sound an alarm when your battery power drops below this level, and the second threshold will actually trigger an automatic return to home. I normally set these at 20 to 25% for the low battery warning and 10 to 15% for the critically low battery warning. The next adjustment you may want to consider is the number of days before the batteries automatically start to discharge if left unused. You can access this by tapping the icon next to the time to discharge setting, and I normally set this for three days to keep my batteries safe. This last question is, where can I check the firmware details in the app? And that's a really great question because if you've been a pilot for any length of time, you already know that firmware is just a part of life. Companies are constantly pushing out firmware to do updates to their products, and invariably it's gonna happen on that beautiful Saturday morning when you power everything up before you get ready to leave the house, and on the application, a little banner will pop up at the bottom saying, hey, there's new firmware out, do you wanna download me and install it? And you're thinking to yourself, I don't know if I do. It was flying yesterday just fine. I don't know if I need to update the firmware. So my suggestion is if you get that message, go to the website, in this case for Autel, and read the release notes for the firmware just to see if there's something in there that you really, really care about. Because a lot of times firmware will fix problems with the drone. Maybe they're squashing bugs that they've uncovered or they've introduced new features that might be interesting to you. So make that decision on your own. But understand that the firmware is sort of an ecosystem of software that touches everything in that ecosystem. So it'll load up on the quad. Typically it'll load up on the controller. It may even load up on the battery. And it's really important that you understand exactly what those firmware levels do and maybe what's changed between the old one you had and the new one they're trying to push to you. So the recommendation I would make is if you decide to do a firmware update, before you even do it, go to the firmware page, and I'll show you how to do that in a second, and screen capture that page. So do a picture on your phone so you've got all the firmware levels before you did the update, and then do it again after you do the update. That way you can compare them side by side in case something funky starts happening after you do the update. But what's interesting about Autel is that they give you a lot of information on that firmware page. They break down all the different firmware levels for the ESCs inside the drone, the gimbal, the controller, a battery. It's got all firmware levels listed in there that are all a little bit different. So their firmware package, when it's loaded, unpacks and goes out and touches all those circuits. Now, most other companies just give you a rough number at the top. They don't tell you all the nuance of what that firmware does, but Autel does. So I'll show you those screens next and show you how to get at them. And again, my suggestion is snap those pictures, archive them on your computer. So if you ever have to roll back to an older version of firmware, or if you've got weird problems and you call Autel, they're gonna say to you, what version of ESC firmware are you on? I don't know, well, save that picture. It's gonna be important if you need it later on. But anyway, I'll show you how to get at those settings now. To check your current versions of firmware, start on the main page of the application and tap the settings icon in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Next tap the generals tab on the left hand side of the screen. Finally tap the firmware version to access the main page. You'll have to scroll to see all the different versions of firmware, but here you'll find all your current versions that are loaded on your quad, your controller and your batteries. And it's a good idea to screenshot this page for future reference if you ever decide to upgrade your firmware later to a newer version. All right, that's pretty much it for this week's questions. Now, if I haven't answered a question that you've got, please send it to us. I'll add it to the list, and I promise you we'll get to it sooner or later. We're doing our best. We're spending a lot of time out in the field. I've been flying this almost every day since it showed up, as long as the weather's good. And I'm telling you, it's an amazingly cool quad. It's got some features in it that are just really advanced beyond anything else that's out there today. And I know I've been raving about it a lot, and I fly all the quads on the market today, but right now this is hands down my favorite quad to be flying. So if you've got questions, send them in, we'll get to them. I hope you find these clips helpful. I'm doing my best to try to stay ahead of all the questions people are asking. I know this is an incredibly popular quad, and there's a lot of interest out there for it. I was lucky to get it early, and I'm happy to do these kind of tests. So if you've got questions, let me be your testing guy to go out there and test it in the field. I'm also gonna put some other clips together walking through the software, because now that I've got the final version, of it, I'm actually going to put a clip together that does a visual walkthrough of all the tabs, all the settings, and everything you need to know about the firmware. I didn't want to do that before now because a lot of times I get beta, I do the clip, and then I find out in the final version they move stuff around and it's not at all correct. So I don't want to put one out there that's a little bit older. I want to start with the fresh stuff. So stay tuned for that. I've also got comparison clips between this and a lot of other popular drones on the market, the Mavic 2, the Skydio 2, the Anafi, and I'll be posting those in the channel very soon as well. And that's pretty much it for today. So again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, happy flying. Thank you.